Hi, my name is Jordana Divon and I manage content here at Borealis AI. We are very excited to bring you the first in a video series that we'll be producing where we will be having conversations with some of the leading minds in artificial intelligence. And the reason we chose to do this on video is some of the conversations and topics we'll be covering require the breadth and the depth that video offers. We hope you'll check back with us frequently and to check in on who we'll be speaking to next. Now, in the meantime, we are very, very excited to present our first interview with Tamara Broderick, who flew in from MIT to speak to us at our Toronto lab, and she was kind enough to stick around to discuss Bayesian inference. Enjoy. One of the things you were talking to the group about earlier during your presentation was variational inference. And the reason that we do variational inference is to arrive at reasonable and tractable approximations for very complex quantities. And we do that, let's go this way, <laughs> and we do that so that we can compute those quantities. Uh, what are your thoughts on perhaps placing more effort on the development of efficient approximate algorithms versus simply requesting more computational power? Right, okay, yeah, so there's, you could think of this as a trade-off between um, computational power oh, hey, and uh, accuracy. A whiteboard. <laughs> it's so perfect. I think a, a useful way to think about this is there is this um, idea of sort of a Pareto optimal boundary. And so we could think of, oh, we might want more accuracy um, or we might sort of expend more power. And so here we can think of saying for a certain amount of power, there's sort of a maximum amount of accuracy that we could get. And similarly, for a certain amount of accuracy, we can imagine that we have to expend at least a certain amount of power to get there. And so when we think about trading off power for accuracy, in some sense, we're moving along this curve. We're saying, oh, by expending more power, we can get more accuracy. But I think that what machine learning researchers are doing is they're really moving the curve itself so that you can say, hey, uh, for a certain level of accuracy, I actually don't have to expend as much power because ideally nobody wants to spend more power. One thing that I want to just change a little slightly about that too is to say that actually this curve doesn't just exist in sort of a power accuracy dimension. There are a lot of other dimensions that are interesting too. You might care about interpretability. Sure, I can have something that's very accurate, but if I'm trying to have like a medical application at the end of the day and I really want to be able to justify why is this person going into surgery, interpretability might be really important. In your opinion, are we getting too reliant on the machine to actually do the math and show our work? One perspective on this question is to say the goal of machine learning in some sense is that nobody has to care about the math. That you know the domain expert can come in here, um, you know, she wants an analysis of her data, and she can say, hey, I have my domain expertise, but I don't have to worry about anything else. I just have to worry about what I know about astrophysics or economics or you know, flight patterns or, or what have you and not worry about the machine learning. And I think that's really our goal. Unfortunately, the reality of the situation is that we don't live in that world. We live in a world right now where really for any machine learning algorithm, you have to kind of have machine learning expert to actually be running it. And so there are a few issues that can arise from that perspective. So one perspective, for instance, um, is that any machine learning algorithm right now has assumptions baked into it and if you have a data person who comes in and they're not familiar with the algorithm, they don't necessarily understand those assumptions that are baked in. And so for them, um, there's this issue of, well, if you don't understand the math that's going into it, if you don't understand the algorithm, then you might be sort of hurt by not understanding that these assumptions are there. And so actually, another area we've been doing research recently um, is in robustness. So quantifying, you know, if I change my assumptions a little bit, even if I don't fully understand, you know, exactly what the effect of these assumptions baked in is, maybe I can have some automatic way, again, ease of use, some automatic way of perturbing them, of saying, hey, what if I had some different assumptions? How much would that change my output? And so then that's something that hopefully, again, is easy for practitioners to use, even if they don't understand all the math that's underlying them. Is there a risk then in the non-traditionalists who are placing all their bets on speed and power? instead of what's going on under the hood? Yeah, I mean, I mean again, I guess I, I don't see um, necessarily a strong risk in that so much as, as long as everybody understands that what's happening is moving along this curve. Um, and so there's a, I think the, the only risk is in not appreciating that moving this curve is actually something that's useful, um, that we can actually do better um, sort of overall by doing this. Do you think it's fair that we're reporting all of these incredible achievements in AI without 
perhaps evaluating the computational cost of the machine versus the human who's actually doing the task. I think this is a really underappreciated um, aspect of machine learning in general. So again, coming back to this Pareto optimality curve, you know, we talked about um, there's accuracy, there's computational power, but there's ease of use. You know, the individual, the data practitioner, actually has to use these algorithms at the end of the day. And so, one thing you definitely don't want them doing is recreating the wheel every time. They shouldn't have to come up with all of the code on their own that you already published in a paper somewhere. They shouldn't have to, you know, recreate code this entire um, machine learning algorithm, like that's time that is actually spent. And so even if we, if we just look at something like computational time of an algorithm, that's completely erasing you know, the potentially months of effort that could go into that. And that's certainly something we've seen with some collaborators, is that they will avoid an algorithm um, because they know that they have to put in those months of effort. Or they'll start putting in those months of effort and then be overwhelmed because that was a huge waste of their time if what they really cared about was the data analysis. How does letting the machine do all the work impact something like understandability? Yeah, so this actually comes back to, I think, a sort of another dimension on this Pareto optimality curve, um, which is a very important dimension um, and sometimes might be called something like interpretability as well, but sort of, you know, there are a lot of things that we want from these algorithms. And one might be, we don't just want something like predictive power, like can this tell me if this is an image of a cat? But we really wanna pinpoint something in a data analysis. So for instance, you know, again, if we're thinking about airplanes, we might wanna be able to say, oh, here was the route that was taken based on some noisy data around it. If we're looking at a bunch of newspaper articles, we might wanna find the topics in those newspaper articles. And so I think in all of these cases, again, it's exactly somewhere on this Pareto optimality curve that you're saying, hey, um, for a certain amount of computational power, given the algorithms that I have, I can achieve this amount of interpretability um, and maybe some amount of uh, sort of accuracy or replicability or something like that. But fundamentally, there needs to be new algorithms to get at the interpretability that we're interested in. And that goes back to doing the math. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. There are a lot of people from some of the more traditional fields like math and physics who are starting to come into this space. And they're having an enormous impact on broadening the scope of what's happening in machine learning and deep learning. Who or what should we be bringing into our labs in order to maximize this impact? So I think this is definitely true. There are a lot of people in machine learning right now who have come from a math or physics background. So actually, uh, this is true of myself as well. So my first research was in astrophysics. And actually a big reason that I got into machine learning is that the tools that we were using for this were fundamentally things like machine learning statistics tools. So we were using Markov Chain Monte Carlo, Fisher Information, all these tools that I use much more regularly now. And in some sense, I really wanted to better understand what was going on there. And so that was one of the things that led me into this field. Because there's so much math and physical intuition involved with machine learning, that we tend to get people from these fields. I mean, math for obvious reasons, you have the sort of um, formal background for this, but physics also tends to be a very rigorous mathematical discipline. Um, and that physical intuition ends up actually being extremely important in a lot of our algorithms. So a lot of the algorithms that we use are based often on some kind of physical intuition. So like even variational Bayes, um, this is an idea that essentially uh, originated in physics. Markov Chain Monte Carlo is an idea that originated in physics. Uh, a lot of the ideas that we use in machine learning uh, sort of had a birth in the physics world under a very different set of circumstances and then sort of migrated on over to what we're doing. Thank you so much, Tamara. Uh, incredible as always, and uh, really appreciated your insights. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs>